Welcome to this special edition webinar and happy International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Today, Sherry Lee, PhD student and research assistant at Manchester Metropolitan University, will present her PhD thesis, Educational Interventions to Improve Municipal Material Recycling Rates Achieved by English Authorities. She will also discuss with us her career to date and reflect on her experience of being a woman in science. Before starting her PhD in 2015, Cheryl spent over 10 years working as an environmental protection officer and an environmental enforcement officer at the Stockport Council. Cheryl has been a member of the IES since 2011 and she achieved the status of Chartered Environmentalist also in 2011. So thank you very much for joining us today and Cheryl, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, as you explained, I'm a research assistant and part-time PhD student within the Waste to Resource Innovation Network at Manchester Metropolitan. Um, our research hub tries to connect academia and industry to advance the aims of uh, circular economy and waste and recycling research. So I've been working in the waste and um, recycling arena for about 20 years and I did my undergrad in environmental conservation and management. And a couple of years after that, I did an MSc in environmental resources. I um, went into a couple of companies and did some plastic uh, recycling and copper recycling schemes. And after that, went to a consultancy to investigate contaminated land and decommissioning petrol stations. And then I went to Stockport Council, as you explained. Um, so during my time there, I gained a diploma in acoustics and noise control. And I also became a member of the IES, as you explained, and a chartered environmentalist. Um, but since the uh, rounds of austerity hitting local authorities, my job became at risk nine years in a row. And I became quite tired of that in the end. So I decided to take voluntary redundancy and fulfill a lifelong dream of doing a PhD. So I applied to MMU and they accepted me on a part time basis. And a little way into my PhD, I successfully applied for a part time job as a research assistant um, within this network and began working on research projects. So that was nearly two years ago now. I love my job and it takes me to different countries working with interesting people. I've been interviewed on the radio in December last year and I've presented at international conferences. So each day is very different and I'm often pushed outside my comfort zone, but it's what keeps it interesting. And not to mention that I'm working in an area that I am hugely passionate about, and that's waste and recycling. And since my time at the university, I've really grown uh, my knowledge and my passion for the circular economy as well. So waste, the world's population is growing and with it, so is the demand for raw materials. And many countries now reliant on other countries to supply those raw materials and also to dispose of the waste but it's becoming an enormous problem. And as you can see, um, children are living on toxic landfills and it doesn't seem to be um, slowing down either. In fact, it's a problem that's increasing. We're seeing between 400,000 and 1 million lives lost every year because of waste and waste management. It's at such a crisis point that China has just filled one of its mega dumps 25 years early. So a mega dump is generally the size of 100 football pitches and 150 metres deep. And that closed 25 years early. So the UK alone produces 223 million tonnes of waste each year. And it's just so hard to imagine how much that is. So recently I went into my um, children's school and I wanted to talk to them about waste and recycling and, and the circular economy as well. And um, I did a very quick calculation of how big their school hall was. And I worked out how much waste Greater Manchester was producing. And we discovered that um, the school hall would fill up one and a half times every hour. So that's 126 tonnes of waste. Um, and just to upscale that again, um, if we did a full day at school, it would fill up seven school halls in six hours. So that's 753 tonnes of waste. And if we upscaled that again, 
to 24 hours, we would produce 3,015 tonnes of waste. That's 36 school halls worth of waste every single day, 365 days a year and every single year. So in Manchester, we have a 47% recycling rate and that's about 17 school halls being recycled every single day, 1,417 tonnes worth. But that still leaves 19 school halls worth of waste not being recycled. And at this stage, this is just waste coming from people's houses. This isn't commercial waste as well. So what do we do with it? We need to slow this waste production down. And if you think about waste as well, that's being made from something. Those raw materials were used to make that waste. And quite often it's items we're just using once um, and then discarding straight away. So if we consider this to be the case for the whole of the UK, if we have a look at the graph, um, in 1617, our recycling rate was 44.9%, which meant that 55% roughly was going to energy from waste or landfill. So DEFRA estimated that 26% of that grey um, was actually recyclable within the current infrastructure. So it was materials that we're currently collecting for recycling, but we're just being put in the landfill or being burnt for energy from waste. So that means with the current infrastructure not being used properly, uh, if we were to use it properly, we'd be able to save 3.8 million tonnes of waste and um, meet these targets for 2025 at 55%. So that's what my PhD is aiming to do and to investigate why are some local authorities performing better than others and to share best practice between them when it comes to designing interventions that change recycling behaviour. So in the UK, um, waste is managed by local authorities and there are 352 of them handling 26.3 million, million tonnes of municipal waste annually. These authorities can be split into three groups. We've got the waste collection authorities, and those are the ones that go house to house picking waste from, um, from your bins on the curbside. And once they've collected your waste, they pass it on to a waste disposal authority. And those are responsible for distributing the waste either to recycling areas or to um, energy from waste or landfill, let's say. And then you've got your unitary authorities, and they both collect waste and dispose of it. So there are um, two distinct factors influencing local authorities' recycling performance. And these are their inherent properties, such as population density and deprivation. And then there are the factors that are within the control of the local authority, such as infrastructure and education. Um, so to be able to compare like-for-like like authorities, the inherent factors needed to be removed from the equation so that local authorities could be compared with other local authorities with the same characteristics. So to do that, I took 287 waste collection authorities and unitary authorities, removing the WDAs because that would just duplicate results. They were placed in this classification scale, which was devised by RAP. Um, so firstly, they were split into three categories based on population density, and then split further into high and low deprivation based on all of this information was based on um, stats from the Office of National Statistics. So this then resulted in six groups, each given the description of, let's say, predominantly urban, high deprivation, or predominantly urban, low deprivation. And for each group, um, a scatter graph of local authorities was produced um, with the recycling rate and the quality rate on each access. The four quadrants were produced by using the national average of each. So the data set I used at the time, the uh, national average recycling rate was 42% and the um, recycling quality was um, 93%. So when waste arrives at the recycling plants or the material recovery facilities, there's a contamination. Um, if there's any contamination, it's rejected. And this is logged into Waste Data Flow, which is a database which all local authorities have to input their waste data monthly. And so I used that data to calculate the quality. So as you can see, the 
good performers are the local authorities who are performing above national average for both quantity and quality and the perform poor performers are the ones in the lower left and they will be the ones performing below average for each. So the main take home points for each um, for all of the graphs were that as population density and deprivation decreases so recycling performance increases. Um, so if you take a look at the graph on the left you can see that all the groups in there um, see that in all groups the number of local authorities in poor performing quadrant reduced removing from predominantly urban to rural with deprivation has small effect on the overall figures but if you take a look at the graph on the right you can clearly see that the number of local authorities in the good performing quadrant hugely increases the more urban a local authority is with high deprivation and less so with the low deprivation if you take a look specifically at the orange bar, um, that's the predominantly urban local authorities, you can see that only 2% of good performers um, were there with high deprivation, whereas there were 41% when there was low deprivation. So deprivation obviously has a huge influence on um, a local authority's ability to recycle. So the next steps in my project were to choose one local authority um, that was performing well and one that wasn't so much within each group and that resulted in 12 local authorities. So I've spent the last year going around the country conducting in-depth interviews with these local authorities and finding out why um, these local authorities with seemingly similar inherent qualities are performing so differently. So I've yet to write up my results um, however, preliminary, there are three main factors that influence the recycling rates that has come to light from the interviews. Infrastructure was a big one, um, such as wagons, types, um, which will have a knock-on effect on the type of receptacle, the collection of frequency and the downstream processes. And infrastructure was very much linked to contracts with the WDAs. Um, these WDUAs had sometimes signed 25 year contracts, tying them into um, sometimes old technologies. And so local authorities aren't able to keep up with um, new and changing uh, technologies. And this has become a real issue for some. And so they've spent a lot of money getting out of these 25 year contracts. Politics was um, one area that was mentioned with every local authority. And that was the pressure of austerity. So they've seen budgets slashed by 17% and they've lost 25% of their workforce um, and 25% actually within environmental services. So local authorities really are having a tough time sort of meeting the demands of uh, central government um, whilst also having their budgets slashed. So we've seen some local authorities still providing um, weekly residual collections when it's known that if you move to a fortnightly it pushes people um, into recycling because of space issues but they keep the weekly recycling because it gives them votes from their from their residents um, we've seen local authorities not making any changes because of the uncertainty of brexit as well so politics actually plays a big part but across the board the higher performing local authorities were the one that were investing in their education and awareness communication um, with their residents. One particular local authority was expanding their waste awareness officers team, um, which was highly unusual because most people are reducing theirs. But they put a business case forward showing that the staff paid for themselves actually on the savings of the gate fees from landfills due to reducing the contamination and that was done by a series of door knocking and face-to-face -face communication breaking down that um, anonymous face of the local authority. So moving on from my PhD as I explained I um, also work as a research assistant and as you can see previously we're currently in a linear economy. We take, we make, we dispose, and that ends up with lots of waste. We have been moving towards a recycling economy, but again, there's still an awful lot of waste. 
So what we need to do is we need to move towards closing the loop. Um, and that is called the circular economy. So we do this by designing out waste and pollution right at the very start of all processes. And we keep products and materials in use for as long as possible, whilst also regenerating the natural systems. And this is an exciting time to be in the circular economy industry because it involves absolutely everyone and everything from individuals to governments and products and services, absolutely everything. And as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation said, it's a new way to design, make and use things within planetary boundaries. So my team at the moment um, has several exciting projects on the go. We've just started or well, kicking off Transforms, which is next week, where we're taking high quality plastics out of the municipal waste stream and we're producing recycled uh, filament for 3D printing and then we're also going to be taking the low grade mixed plastics and in using it for injection and extrusion moulding. This is a 9.6 million euro project which is being managed by MMU and it is, it is their idea. It's um, got 35 industry partners, it's a very exciting project to be involved in. We also have a Bioplastics Europe project um, to encourage innovations in the production of bioplastics. And there's also reduces, um, and that is reviewing best practice of circular economy business models around partner countries. Um, but the list is endless. And if you take a look at our website, you'll be able to get more information. But my project that I've been working on for the last two and a half years is an Erasmus Plus waste education initiative. Um, so by 2030, the EU has stated that the circular economy is going to create between 1.2 and 3 million jobs in the EU member states alone, and it's looking to reduce unemployment by over half a million. So this ed um, education initiative, it's aiming to create a waste aware and motivated generation who are really green sector ready. And for those that gain jobs outside of the green sector, they're thinking circular, taking that information and that thinking with them. Um, the project has five partners. Um, we have us, of course, in Manchester. We've got the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. We have Hamburg in Germany, Tallinn in Estonia and um, Bucharest, Romania, and Zagreb in Croatia. So the aim of the project is to investigate current levels of waste education within these five regions and to share best practice and to highlight any gaps in the system. So the first stage was involved sending a questionnaire out to all education providers to determine the baseline of waste on circular economy education. And based on those results, we were to produce a waste citizens website, teaching pack and a circular economy guide for students and residents. Um, but the project initially highlighted the differences between the regions. And this graph in particular shows um, a light green, um, the population of each region in light green and the geographical area in the dark green. So you can see Manchester has the largest population at 2.79 million and Bucharest is um, not far behind at 2.12 million. But what's interesting is, is that the area, the geographical area of Manchester is 1,200 kilometres just over, whereas Bucharest is 238. So in other words, there's 2.2 million, uh, sorry, 2.2 people per square metre in Manchester whereas there's 8.9 people per square metre in Bucharest. This means that a lot of people in Bucharest are living in apartments and tower blocks. And previous research has shown that multiple occupancy buildings are inherently difficult to service when it comes to waste management. If anyone's ever lived in flats or apartments, they'll know their waste bin store is often filthy and very uncared for. Um, tourism between the areas as well um, can have a massive effect on their fluctuations of population numbers and it could put a real strain on the um, local waste management systems. So both Zagreb and Bucharest have huge hordes of people coming to visit them. Sometimes some of the smaller islands can see their population growing by several hundred percent. These different characteristics all have an influence on the waste management um, 
within within these countries. So this is um, a graph showing the waste and recycling rates within each area. You can see both Hamburg and Greater Manchester at 47%. Um, and Tallinn is at 30. So all three countries provide a curbside collection to their residents, collecting different um, streams, either commingled or uh, green waste, food waste and residual waste. But the difference between Tallinn and the other two is the um, frequency of residual collection. So both Hamburg and Greater Manchester collect every fortnight, whereas Tallinn provide a residual collection between one and three times a week and that will reduce the incentive to recycle for their for their residents. Both Bucharest and Zagreb don't provide a curbside collection scheme at the moment, although Zagreb is about to introduce it. The Bucharest are looking more into um, energy from waste plants rather than recycling. So we sent questionnaires out to schools and local authorities, colleges and universities to see what waste education, if any, was being delivered. And waste education was limited or missing from the curriculum in all cities. Some co uh, covered the topic in ad hoc science weeks, but it was very low on the priority due to time and budgetary constraints. In fact, most teachers weren't even aware of existing materials currently available. So it highlighted that better signposting was needed. Um, higher education teachers said that staff training was needed on waste education as waste was often not seen as a resource and again really low down on the priority and there was little to no um, knowledge of the circular economy across the board. So to incorporate the feedback from the questionnaire, the teaching guide and resource pack was made available to the teachers to use free of charge, can be downloaded off the website in their classrooms. And it includes 14 lesson plans around waste, recycling and covering concepts like the circular economy. We then extended this to lecturers in universities too. So the packs can be used from people aged eight all the way up to adults and including adults. Um, we also uh, developed an information leaflet for residents and students explaining the concept of the circular economy. Um, it highlights some of the circular economy initiatives in Greater Manchester and also gives advice on how to go circular as an individual. And um, we produced a different uh, guide for each region or covering the same elements, but just different examples. So again, this is on the website and we developed some Kahoot games, which is really good fun to play. So please go and find them if you're if you're interested in learning about the circular economy or more. Um, so feel free to have a look around um, our website. And if you put Erasmus plus Waste EI into Google, we'll be the top hit. You can also follow our work on Waste Citizens. And um, please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions. Perfect. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was uh, really clear, really, really interesting as well. Um, so thank you very much. I, I would like now to ask you a few questions uh, regarding your experience uh, of as a woman of the sector, uh, and 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 uh, since you have such an interesting uh, career uh, journey as well, it seems like you have experienced uh, both um, the public and civil sector as well as the academia. So I really wanted to ask you uh what what are, what's what's your uh, experience of it as a woman so uh, first of all uh you say that you were really engaged with uh, um especially with the uh, waste management uh, area since very young age uh, and i was wondering how was your experience at university already and if you had any uh, uh role model back then um i found my interest in the environment during my A-levels, actually. I remember being at the beach with family and we were talking about how, if we could harness that energy, we could solve the uh, energy crisis. And that really got me into a biology mindset. And then um, I kind of fell into the waste sector after. The environmental field I found quite difficult to get into. So between my two degrees, I had a year out trying to find jobs and that's pretty much why I went back to uni to do a master's to give me that step up. Um, 
at the time, I hadn't really got a mentor as such, but not until I came across Julie Hill at a conference once, and she was talking about her secret life of stuff, and I asked for it as a Christmas present, and I read it, and I found it fascinating. And I was in awe of her and her career, and I'm also a big fan of Ellen MacArthur. Um, her foundation is fantastic, and both of these women are brilliant role models within the industry, I feel. Thank you very much. And another question I would like to ask you uh, regarding yeah, your career journey again. Um, what, are, what were the biggest obstacles you had to overcoming your career? And have you ever felt like your gender played a part in these challenges? It's a tricky one to answer that one. I suppose one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was change job. Um, right at the very beginning after my first role. I, I was doing it for three years. It was a, a heavily male industry. Um, I was out on site a lot with um, people operating machinery. I, I, you know, women are less seen, maybe more so these days, but 20 years ago, less so. Um, but I did have um, a, one colleague who was male, so I don't know if it was a gender thing, but he, he mocked me consistently and in part that was the reason why I left the job um, and it was hard I think trying to leave a role because you're either unhappy or bored can make it difficult to perform well in interviews because you need to sell yourself um, <laughs> um, but thankfully it was a brilliant move for me and my career and my confidence soared because of it and luckily I've not come across that again so I don't know if that was more of the site working industry or element to it Thank you very much for sharing this with us. Um, one more question, and, and in your opinion, really, uh, how could the sector develop to be more attractive to women and those interested in joining the sector in the future? So what changes should we really see or what, what can be done? So I believe the waste sector, recycling sector, it's so broad you know you can choose a role that really suits you in your interest but i think what's really key and is I, I don't think it's really sort of this sector specific but we need to have flexible roles because women have a lot going on outside of just work they sometimes have family they have uh, they're also caring for relatives maybe and so they need a job that supports that work-life balance um but it is a large enough sector that there's many different kinds of jobs. So hopefully someone should be able to find something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And, uh, and, and si since you mentioned this, and, and also you mentioned earlier that uh, you are a mother, and I, I was wondering whether you could tell us uh, how do you juggle all these different commitments? And you, you also mentioned that in the last year you have been also traveling a lot in the UK uh, and so I was just wondering if you could share with us uh, perhaps a, a, a typical day for you like how does how does that look? Um, typical day is a tricky one to answer actually because it can vary massively like you say I would, did quite a bit of foreign travel yes last year as well as well as going around the country I've got a fabulous husband who um, covers me while I'm not around <laughs> as such um, but I've got two young children, they're six and seven, and they come with an enormous amount of admin themselves. I constantly feel like I'm juggling. I've got two whiteboards, two calendars. I've got several to-do lists all going off all at once. But occasionally I get things wrong and I do drop a ball every so often. But we tend to have a lot of fun along the way and we survive. So that's what counts. <laughs> um, but yeah, I usually get up, get my kids ready for school and I'm sitting down at my desk for 8.30 in the morning. I work at home a lot, so that does save on the commute. And I've got a home office, which helps. Um, occasionally I work evenings as well. So I'll help out at the Green Summit or we have a circular economy club, Manchester, that's run by my colleagues. So I often help um, with evening events with that. And then I'll have the school run, cook dinner, kids homework, read with them, make sure their clothes are ready for the next day. Um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, thank you very much again for sharing this with us. Really, really interesting. And uh, um, I would like also to ask you uh, something else. Uh, well, well, we have uh, here at the IES, uh, we have over 1,500 student members uh, interested in working in the sector, in the environmental um, sector, really. Is there anything you uh, feel academia should be doing to support uh, females further? Uh, maybe if you can share maybe something in your experience, something that perhaps can be done also in the academia. Um, so I think it has to start from before uni, really. We need to be building confidence and resilience. Um, it's well proven time and again that women don't have the same level of confidence as their male counterparts. And this can really hinder them in job interviews and progression within companies. We need to give young women the tools to become the best of themselves and whatever they choose to be. So I'm a firm believer in that. I recently had my five-year-old come home from school and say, girls are just pretty. Girls don't, girls aren't clever. So um, obviously, as you can imagine, <laughs> I set about a good um, uh, every evening talking about different girl scientists women in sport and actually there's so many strong women out there and we need to learn from them and, and we need to teach that from not just when people go to university it needs to be done from infant school absolutely that that was really well put yeah thank you very much for answering the question so a very last question to, to conclude I mean, you, you, you say several times that you're really happy about the projects you're working on right now. So I think you really, uh, your career journey has brought you where you want to uh, be. I would like to ask you whether you have any advice that you would give to uh, your younger self. Um, yeah, I'd sleep more. <laughs> <laughs> Fill that sleep bank as much as you can, but really look after yourself, both your mind and body, and be brave. Speak at conferences, push yourself, meet people. You know, it's more than just hobnobbing. This is developing yourself and, and learning from others. It's um, Working at the university has taught me that, and it's a fantastic thing to have, the ability to be able to do walk in and, and just strike a conversation up about waste and recycling and you tend to find people in the sector are madly passionate about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Cyril. Thank you very much for sharing all of this with us and answering these questions. Um, I would also like to remember uh, to all the um, viewers to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, so that you will be notified every time a new webinar is added. And I would also like to invite um, everyone to register for our next webinar, which is um, Seeking Sustainability for Coffee Farmers and Consumers, uh, which will be presented by Jeremy Hagar on the 26th of February. Uh, you can register for these on our um, on the IES events page on our website. And uh, so I very much invite you to do this. And Thank you very much again, everyone, for listening. And thank you very much, Sherry, for sharing all of this with us. Thank you.